In 2011, Florida had a problem. Invasive apple snails were destroying wetlands, eating every native plant in sight, and spreading uncontrollably. The solution seemed simple. Release their natural predator. Two million rosy wolf snails, carnivorous snails that eat other snails, drop them in the marshes and let nature handle it. Biologists predicted the wolf snails would eliminate the apple snails within three years. By 2014, the apple snails were thriving. Their population had actually increased by 40%. Native tree snails, rare species that had survived in Florida for thousands of years. Within 18 months, seven species of native snails went functionally extinct. The wolf snails ignored their intended prey and annihilated species that weren't even part of the problem. But here's what makes this ecological disaster so perfectly predictable in hindsight. The same thing has happened over 50 times in the past century. Humans release a predator to control an invasive species. The predator ignores the target and devastates natives instead. We've seen this pattern in Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand, and dozens of Caribbean islands. And yet, we keep doing it because we think this time will be different. This is what actually happened when Florida released two million carnivorous snails, why the entire plan was doomed from the start, and how one bad decision created a cascade of ecological destruction that we're still dealing with in 2025. Let's be clear. Florida did have a legitimate crisis. Apple snails, specifically the island apple snail from South America, were introduced in the 1980s by aquarium dumpers. These snails are massive, growing to the size of baseballs, and they're voracious. Each snail can consume its body weight in vegetation daily. By 2010, apple snails had spread across 80% of Florida's freshwater wetlands. They were eating sawgrass, the foundation species of the Everglades ecosystem. Areas that should be dense with vegetation were turning into open water because apple snails ate everything down to the roots. This wasn't minor damage. This was fundamental ecosystem transformation. The ecological impact was cascading. Birds that nested in sawgrass lost habitat. Fish that spawned in vegetation had nowhere to reproduce. Water quality deteriorated because plants weren't filtering nutrients. The entire food web was collapsing because one invasive species was eating the base of the pyramid. Florida Wildlife Commission estimated the economic damage at $100 million annually. Agricultural irrigation systems clogged with snail eggs. Water treatment facilities spent millions removing shells from intake pipes. Everglades restoration projects failed because apple snails ate newly planted vegetation faster than it could establish. So the logic seemed sound. Apple snails are invasive. We need to control them. What eats apple snails? In their native South America, various predators control apple snail populations, including snail kites, a specialized bird, and carnivorous snails. The rosy wolf snail specifically. Rosy wolf snails hunt other snails by following their slime trails. When they catch prey, they extend a specialized mouth part and consume the victim alive. They're efficient predators, and in laboratory tests, they readily ate apple snails. Perfect solution. Release the predator. Eliminate the pest. Restore the ecosystem. But here's where the plan started falling apart before the first wolf snail was ever released. Every piece of evidence from previous attempts at biological control was ignored. The rosy wolf snail has a history, and that history is catastrophic. This species has been released as biocontrol in Hawaii. Tahiti, American Samoa, Guam, and multiple Caribbean islands. In every single case, the results were disastrous. In Hawaii, the giant African snail was the target pest. Introduced in 1936, it was destroying agriculture and native plants. In 1955, Hawaii released rosy wolf snails as biocontrol. The wolf snails immediately ignored the giant African snails which were large, tough, and produced defensive slime. Instead, they hunted endemic Hawaiian tree snails. Small, delicate, 
with thin shells, easy prey. Within 20 years, over half of Hawaii's 750 native snail species went extinct. The International Union for Conservation of Nature lists the rosy wolf snail as one of the top 100 most damaging invasive species in the world. Biologists call it the cannibal snail because it causes more damage than the pests it's meant to control. The pattern was identical across every location. Tahiti released wolf snails in 1974 to control giant African snails. Result, 56 of 61 endemic parchula tree snail species extinct. Guam released them in 1982. Result, multiple endemic tree snails extinct within a decade. American Samoa, same story. Caribbean Islands, same story. When Florida was planning its release, there were 50 documented cases of rosy wolf snails failing as biocontrol and succeeding as extinction engines. 50 case studies showing exactly what would happen. Scientific papers explicitly warning against using this species for biocontrol. International conservation organizations begging governments to stop releasing wolf snails. Florida did it anyway. The official justification was that Florida's situation was different. The apple snails were larger than previous target species. The marshes were more extensive. The native snails were more robust. This time would work. The data from 50 previous failures was dismissed as irrelevant. In March 2011, Florida released 2 million rosy wolf snails across 15,000 acres of wetlands in central and southern Florida. The snails came from captive breeding facilities. They were released during the wet season when apple snail activity peaks. Biologists predicted measurable apple snail population reduction within six months. The wolf snails did exactly what they'd done everywhere else. They took the path of least resistance. Apple snails are difficult prey. They're large, sometimes five inches in diameter. They produce copious defensive mucus, they can retract completely into their shells and close them with a hard operculum, basically a trap door. Attacking an apple snail requires extended effort for uncertain reward. Native Florida tree snails are easy prey. They're small, one to two inches, thin shells, minimal defensive capabilities. They move slowly and predictably. They're common in areas. Wolf snails were released. From a predator's perspective, this is a buffet versus a locked safe. The wolf snails followed slime trails to tree snails, consumed them effortlessly, and moved to the next victim. Population models later showed that a single wolf snail could consume 50 to 100 native tree snails per year. With 2 million wolf snails released, the predation pressure was catastrophic. Within six months, biologists noticed the problem. Native tree snail populations were crashing in areas where wolf snails had been released. The Liguus tree snail, a species with over 50 distinct color forms that had fascinated naturalists for a century, became increasingly rare. Surveys that previously found 20 to 30 individuals per tree now found zero. By 2012, multiple endemic tree snail species were listed as critically endangered. The Florida tree snail, the Stock Island tree snail, and several subspecies of Liguus were functionally extinct in most of their historic range. They persisted only in small refugia where wolf snails hadn't reached yet. And the apple snails? Completely unaffected. Population surveys in 2012, 2013, and 2014 showed apple snail numbers stable or increasing in areas where wolf snails were released. The intended target was thriving. The collateral damage was extinct. But here's where it gets worse. The wolf snails didn't just stay in the release areas. They spread. Rosy wolf snails can move 100 meters per week. They follow slime trails across vast distances. Within three years, wolf snails had colonized areas 50 miles from release sites. Native tree snails that had survived in isolated habitat patches suddenly faced predation from an enemy they'd never encountered. Refugia that should have been safe became extinction zones. Biologists estimated that wolf snails had contributed to the decline or extinction of at least seven native snail species and were threatening 15 more. 
Removing snails from an ecosystem doesn't just eliminate snails, it eliminates everything that depends on snails. Multiple species of specialized predators evolved to eat tree snails. The rosy wolf snail, ironically, had indigenous predators, certain beetles, some parasitic flies, and specialized birds all fed on native tree snails. When the native snails disappeared, these predators lost their food source. Several endemic beetle species declined dramatically. A subspecies of thrush that specialized in eating tree snails saw population crashes of 60% in areas where snails went extinct. The ecological connections weren't obvious until they broke. Many tree snails feed on epiphytic fungi growing on trees. These snails act as dispersal agents, spreading fungal spores through their feces. When snails disappeared, fungal distribution changed. Some rare fungi that depended on snail dispersal became increasingly restricted, but the most unexpected impact was on vegetation. Tree snails eat algae, lichen, and fungus growing on tree bark. They don't eat the trees themselves, but they maintain the bark surface ecology. Without snails, algae and lichen grew unchecked in some areas and declined in others depending on complex factors. Biologists still don't fully understand. Tree health metrics showed measurable changes in areas where snail populations collapsed. And throughout all of this, the apple snails continued thriving. The intended target of the biocontrol program wasn't just unaffected, it was potentially benefiting. Some researchers theorized that removing native snails actually helped apple snails by reducing competition for resources and possibly eliminating native snails that competed for egg-laying sites. Here's the frustrating pattern. Biological control fails catastrophically. Scientists write papers documenting the failure. Conservation organizations issue warnings. And then another government agency decides their situation is different and tries the same thing. The rosy wolf snail debacle in Florida happened 56 years after Hawaii's disaster. Hawaii's data was public. The failures were well documented. International guidelines explicitly listed rosy wolf snails as unsuitable for biocontrol. Florida knew all of this and proceeded anyway. The problem is psychological and political. When facing an invasive species crisis, agencies feel pressure to do something, anything. Chemical control is expensive and politically unpopular. Manual removal is labor-intensive and insufficient. Biological control sounds perfect, natural, elegant, self-sustaining. Release a predator and walk away. But biological control only works under extremely specific conditions. The predator must be highly specialized, preferring the target species over all alternatives. The predator must not be able to survive if the target species is eliminated, creating a self-limiting system. The ecosystem must be simple enough that unintended impacts can be predicted. Florida's marshes met none of these criteria. Rosy wolf snails are generalist predators that eat whatever snail is easiest. They survive perfectly fine after eliminating preferred prey by switching to alternatives. The marsh ecosystem is complex with hundreds of species and thousands of interactions that can't be fully modeled. The success rate of biological control is somewhere around 10 to 15 percent, meaning 85 to 90 percent of attempts fail. Some fail neutrally. The predator dies out without establishing. Some fail catastrophically. The predator becomes invasive itself. Very few succeed as planned. Yet agencies keep trying because the alternative is admitting that some invasive species can't be controlled. Apple snails in Florida probably can't be eliminated. Their spread slowed, their damage mitigated, but complete eradication isn't realistic. That's an uncomfortable truth that politicians and agencies don't want to accept. It's 2025, 14 years after the release. The rosy wolf snails are now permanent residents of Florida. They've spread across most of central and southern Florida's wetlands. Their population is estimated at 20 to 30 million, 10 times the initial release. They're still eating native tree snails wherever they find them. At least seven native snail species are now considered functionally extinct in the wild. 
They exist only in captive breeding programs and a few isolated refugia that biologists actively protect with barriers to prevent wolf snail invasion. Several other species are critically endangered. The apple snails, thriving. Their population has increased since 2011. The Everglades continues to be damaged by their feeding. New control methods are being tested, chemical treatments, manual removal, egg crushing programs. None are particularly effective. The original problem remains unsolved while the biocontrol solution created additional problems. Florida Wildlife Commission now lists the rosy wolf snail as an invasive species. The same species they intentionally released is now officially classified as a threat. Management programs spend resources trying to control wolf snail populations in sensitive areas. The irony is absolute, but here's the most frustrating part. Other states are still considering biological control for invasive species problems. Louisiana is dealing with apple snails. Texas has invasive snail issues. And in both states, there are proposals to use predatory snails as biocontrol. The Florida disaster is recent, well-documented, and apparently insufficient to change the pattern. The apple snail problem required management, not elimination. Integrated pest management, combining multiple approaches. Targeted herbicide application to reduce vegetation apple snails prefer mechanical harvesting in sensitive areas. Egg mass removal programs, apple snails lay bright pink eggs above the waterline that are easy to locate and destroy. Public education to prevent aquarium dumping that introduced them originally. These methods are less dramatic than releasing two million predators. They're more expensive. They require ongoing effort rather than one-time release. But they work without creating ecological disasters. Hawaii learned this lesson after their wolf snail catastrophe. They now use integrated management for invasive species, more expensive and less politically appealing. But it doesn't drive endemic species extinct. Florida knew Hawaii's history. They chose to ignore it, and the consequence is permanent. You can't undo extinction. The native tree snail species that disappeared aren't coming back. The ecological relationships that took thousands of years to evolve were destroyed in 18 months. The wolf snails will never be removed. They're too widespread, too adaptable, too difficult to target without harming other species. Florida added a permanent invasive predator to an ecosystem already stressed by climate change. Development and existing invasive species. Biological control sounds elegant in theory. Use nature to fix nature's problems. But ecosystems aren't machines where you can replace parts and adjust variables. They're complex adaptive systems with emergent properties that can't be predicted from individual components. Every predator has preferences. Those preferences are based on energy return versus effort invested. Lab studies showing wolf snails eat apple snails are accurate, but they don't capture field conditions where easier prey is available. A predator will always take the path of least resistance. Florida bet two million snails that wolf snails would choose difficult prey over easy prey. They lost that bet, and native species paid the price. The Florida wolf snail disaster is now taught in conservation biology courses as a case study in how not to manage invasive species. It's in textbooks alongside cane toads in Australia and mongooses in Hawaii. Future biologists learn about it, and hopefully when they're making policy decisions in 30 years, they remember that this time is never different. The pattern always repeats. Biological control fails predictably and catastrophically more often than it succeeds. Florida released two million snails to solve a problem and created a bigger problem instead. The apple snails are still there. The native tree snails mostly aren't. That's what happens when you ignore 50 previous disasters and convince yourself this time will be different.